previously on Grace to You. In our world, we're slaughtering between 50 and 60 million babies a year. How did we ever get here? That we have reached the point that we have where one of the two political parties in this country includes slaughtering innocent infants in the womb as a part of its platform which it advocates. But God in grace redeems those who have been slaughtered but holds the killers responsible for the crime. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Romans chapter 1 verses 18 to 32 describes the wrath of God that is unleashed in the world. The wrath of God is divided into a number of elements. There is eschatological wrath, that is the wrath that will fall on the earth at the end of human history in a time called the time of tribulation. There is sowing and reaping wrath, that is the wrath of God that comes consequent on sin, whatever a man sows he reaps. There is a cataclysmic wrath, that is the wrath of God that He sets on man from miraculous use of the natural order such as the flood or any other massive disaster that catapults souls into eternity. So there is that wrath of God which is eschatological and which is consequential and which is cataclysmic. And then there is that wrath of God which is, and that would be the wrath of God unleashed on the ungodly forever in the punishments of eternal hell. But the wrath that is being referred to in Romans 1 isn't any of those. It is the wrath of abandonment. The wrath described here is the wrath that is executed when, according to verses 24, 26, and 28, God gives them over gives them over, gives them over. In other words, it's when God abandons a nation. It's when God abandons a society and gives them over to the consequences of their behavior which is escalating iniquity and disaster leading to judgment. This wrath of God is released from heaven, revealed from heaven, verse 18 says, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. And it goes on to say they all have the truth. The truth is visible from creation. You can know something of God and His nature. And from the heart, Romans 2 says the law of God is written in the heart. But when man abandons God as revealed in creation, when man abandons God as revealed in conscience, when man abandons God as revealed in Holy Scripture, suppressing the truth, God judges that society. And though that society may consider itself to be wise, it is in reality the ultimate ship of fools. The heart becomes darkened when God is abandoned, and then God abandons the darkened heart. What you see in Romans chapter 1 is the sequence of what happens when God abandons a nation. First, verse 24 says, He gives them over to the lusts of their hearts to impurity, sexual sin, the dishonoring of their bodies among them. When God abandons a society, the first thing that happens is it becomes pornographic. It becomes obsessed with sex, obsessed with fornication, adultery, every kind of sexual behavior. We have gone through that already in the sexual revolution a couple of decades ago. The second thing that happens when God abandons a culture is found in verse 26. God gave them over to degrading passions 
Their women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural, in the same way also the men abandon the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error." At the end of that verse, receiving in their persons the due penalty is the diseases that come consequent to homosexual behavior. And as you know, they unleashed on the world the horror of AIDS. But what it's saying here is that when God abandons a a nation or a culture under His wrath, there will be a sexual revolution followed by a homosexual revolution. And we are living in this very condition. There's a third step. Verse 28, God gave them over to a depraved mind. That's a mind that doesn't function. They can't think right. And so life becomes filled with unrighteousness, wickedness, greed evil, envy, murder. Also characteristic of this depraved mind is they become haters of God, haters of God. We're living in the outpouring of the wrath of God in the category of His abandoning a culture, and we're living the sequence that is here, a sexual revolution, a homosexual revolution, a reprobate mind that unleashes everything, including murder on a massive scale, and hate toward God. Now all of a sudden, not only is this characteristic of our nation, but we now promote it. One of the parties, the Democratic Party, has now made Romans 1, the sins of Romans 1, their agenda. What God condemns, they affirm. What God punishes, they exalt. Shocking, really. The Democratic Party has become the anti-God party, the sin-promoting party. You say, well, our society cultivates uh, tolerance and you're, you're giving hate speech. What I'm saying is not hate speech. What the Democratic Party is saying is hate speech because they must hate the homosexuals, if they will allow them to go the direction they're going, affirm that knowing that it'll take them to hell. That's hate speech. This is love speech. You either warn them or you affirm them. And Romans 1 warns them, and any faithful Christian warns This is dangerous. This is deadly. It's better to warn them than to affirm them. You might be the nice guy to affirm them, but that's not love speech, that's hate speech. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And what I'm going to do is just put you in touch with what the Word of God says so you'll know the truth. The news is very bad, but the news can also be very good. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived by the propaganda, by the media, by the films, the television programs, everything you're exposed to, educators. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, that's people who engage in heterosexual sin, nor idolaters and uh, sexual sin and idolatry always historically have been connected, nor adulterers, that's people who have relationships with other than their spouse, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. 
We exist as a church to proclaim the kingdom of God. Our responsibility is to tell people about the kingdom of God and who can be in the kingdom of God and who is excluded from the kingdom of God. That's the ministry of the church. That's what we do. That's what every preacher must do. And I'm not the one who makes the terms. I am only the one responsible to God to proclaim what God has revealed. And I'm here to tell you that if you advocate a life of sexual sin, adultery, fornication, effeminateness, or homosexuality, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. What that means is you're on your way to hell, not heaven. This is the spiritual kingdom of those who are in Christ. Church is made up of people who uh, were like this. Please notice, here's the good news, verse 11, such were some of you. That's right. This is the church in Corinth. And what is the church made up? Of all righteous people who've been righteous since they were born? No, there aren't any. All sinners. The church is a collection of former fornicators, former idolaters, former adulterers, former effeminates, former thieves, former coveters, former extortioners, and former homosexuals. Such were some of you. That statement alone indicates this is not some genetic defect. You were this way, you aren't anymore any more than every other thing is to be genetically blamed. Do do people fornicate because of some kind of a genetic defect? Is that why they're idolaters? Is that why they steal? Is that why they covet? Is that why they're drunkards? Is that why they're revilers and swindlers? If so, then we better have equal rights for all of them and let them all start lobby groups so that they can get us all to recognize that this is a genetic issue. Such were some of you, but, this is key, you were sanctified. You know what that means? Separated from that sin. Separated from that sin. People say, well, you know, if you're, if you're homosexual, you know, you, you can't really ever be changed. It's not what Scripture says. You were like this, but you are sanctified. You're separated from that behavior. It doesn't just say you were justified, that's forensic. I'm glad it doesn't just say you were justified because then people would say, yes, I am forgiven, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to me, I'm justified, but I still have the same sort of a tendency. No. You were justified, but you were also washed and sanctified, changed, separated in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that work is done by the Spirit of our God. This is the message that we want to give to to the world. These are sins that send people to hell, and people who advocate these things and live these lifestyles will not inherit the kingdom of God, and hell is forever. And we're here in love to speak love speech and say, you must escape the wrath to come by repenting and fleeing these sins, and you can be washed and transformed and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Through the years at Grace Church, and I've been here a long time, since 1969, this church has existed in a hotbed of homosexual activity in Southern California. And I've had um, my share of personal uh, opportunity to meet people who have been washed and sanctified and justified, and some of them are sitting among you and you don't even know that because they were saved from that, just as there are adulterers and swindlers and, and the rest that make up a redeemed congregation. I've had some credible experiences. I can remember going down to a local hospital, and a young man dying of AIDS, raised in a Christian family rejected the gospel, lived twenty-plus years in a blatant, outrageous homosexual lifestyle. The L.A. Police Department told me some years ago that uh, the numbers of uh, partners that active homosexuals have would be an average of about five hundred, some as many as a thousand. That kind of lifestyle. 
This young man in, in his room was surrounded by these kinds of friends. He had called the church to say, could someone come? He was dying and he was afraid to die. And he held my hand and squeezed my hand and, and I, I prayed that God would forgive him and save him and he cried out to God and repented of his sin and pled with God to be merciful and gracious and save him. His name was David and I prayed and he was squeezing the life out of my hand. And then when the prayer was over, he just looked still and he looked at the clock on the wall. I said, what are you looking at? He said, I want to remember the time of my salvation. And he lived for a few more weeks and all those people shunned him. I've seen that and not just once. And that's why we're here to preach the message of deliverance to the people who are trapped in that horrible sin. I can't imagine that somehow it could be illegal in the United States of America to speak in love to those people and that some party in this country would adapt the tolerance of homosexuality as something they affirm. Unbelievable. Go with me back now to 1 Corinthians 6 for just a minute. In 1 Corinthians 6, we, we, we see these words that I just want to draw to your attention. You know the word fornicator, that's porneia from which the word pornography comes idolaters, because sexual sin was connected to idolatry. All the idol temples had uh, priestesses that were nothing but prostitutes and it was all mingled together. And you know what adultery is, uh, having sex with someone other than your spouse. But take the word effeminate there, that's the word malakas. Malakas is a technical term for the passive partner in homosexual relations. It actually came to refer to the male prostitute who offered himself anonymously for homosexual vice. So that's worse some of you, but you're washed, sanctified, justified. The word homosexual is arsenokoites. Koites is the word for bed. Arseno is a, a term for man, going to bed with a man. That's what it means. It means going to bed with a man. People who do that don't inherit the kingdom of God. Looking back into the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 22.5, a woman shall not wear man's clothing, nor shall a man put on a woman's clothing, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Uh, that would be called um, transvestism in my day. Um, in, in this modern day, it's called cross-dressing. Leviticus. Chapter 18, just further understanding of this, verse 22, you shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It's an abomination. It's an abomination to dress like the opposite sex. It's an abomination to have a relationship with someone of the same sex. You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination. And it's right alongside having intercourse with an animal with an animal, bestiality, nor shall any woman stand before an animal to mate with it. It is perversion. That, that's the level of this perversion, just like a woman having a relationship with an animal. And the land, he says, will be defiled. Don't defile yourselves, verse 24. For by all these the nations which I'm casting out before you have become defiled." There's Romans 1. That's why that judgment comes, because of these kinds of perversions. God abandons and then judges nations. Verse 30 ends this section, you keep my charge, keep my commands. Don't practice any of these abominable customs which have been practiced before you so as not to defile yourselves with them. Why? I am the Lord. And verse 2, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. He's saying to His people, you have to stand against this. It's a shocking thing when this becomes the agenda to support. 
God's law is unchanging. God's law is unchangeable. God's attitude towards sin is the same. And if you want to see a picture of God's attitude toward homosexuality and what's going to happen when Romans 1 reaches its ultimate culmination and judgment comes, or, or when God does what he, he said He was going to do in, in the writings of Moses to nations that are defiled, that He would bring about their spewing out. Here's an illustration. Genesis 19, way back in the beginning of human history, there's a, there's a city called Sodom, another city, Gomorrah, cities of the plain that are basically literally defined by homosexuality so that the word sodomite means homosexual. It's that fast that this sin has taken off. Two angels come to Sodom in the evening in human form, which angels can do and did in the Old Testament frequently. And uh, Lot is sitting at the gate of Sodom. Lot's living there. Uh, he chose to live there. So these angels show up. He rose to meet them, bowed down with his face to the ground. And he said, Now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house. Spend the night, wash your feet that you may rise early and go on your way. You've got to get in my house, get cleaned up, get up in the morning and get out of here. No, we shall spend the night in the square, the angels say. We're just going to stay here in the square. Um, he urged them strongly, verse 3, is, so they turned aside and entered his house, and he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Uh, they were real physical bodies that these angels had taken on, and, and he showed them this kindness, and he was really trying to protect them. Before they lay down, verse 4, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. The whole place is caught up in sodomy. The whole place, young and old, from every part of town, they have just seen two beautiful men show up in town. And the word is going around town and they're ready for a mass rape. And they show up at Lot's house. And they said, where, verse 5, are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. But they wanted to rape him, gang rape him. Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Do not act wickedly. And then he makes a, probably what he thought was a safe suggestion, I have two daughters who haven't had relations with men. Please let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever you like, only do nothing to these men in so much as they have come under the shelter of my roof." This is kind of a stupid thing to do, but it, this is a kind of a perversion that has no interest in what is normal. That's how far it's gone. Maybe he felt safe. It's still a stupid thing to do. They said, stand aside, out of the way. Furthermore, they said, this one came in as an alien, and already he is acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. You get out of our way, or we will do worse to you than we're about to do to them. Nice group. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. And the men, the angels, reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house and shut the door. And then they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great. They all went stone blind, supernaturally. And listen to this. So they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. What? If I had just gone blind, I think I'd be thinking about, what happened? How did I get blind? I better... I'd, I'd be running like a, like a madman. They're all blind and it doesn't change anything. In their blindness. They're wearying themselves to find the door. Then the two men said to Lot, well, whom else have you here, a son-in-law and your sons and your daughters and whomever you have in the city, bring him out of the place, for we're about to destroy this place. 
because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. That's the message, folks. You live like this and God will send His destroying angels. And you know the rest of the story. That is precisely what happened. Verse 24, the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. He overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground destroyed the whole thing. That's an illustration of how God feels about a society that affirms homosexuality and people that conduct themselves this way. From this time on, from Genesis 19 on, the word for homosexual is the word sodomy, sodomy, sodomy. A homosexual was a sodomite. It is preposterous to call them gay. Homosexual is clinical. Sodomite is biblical, but sinner is theological. It's a horrible thing, this sin. And it's a horrible thing for people to advocate it as normal. Now go back to Romans 1, verse 32. The end of all of this in this section is that although they know the ordinance of God, is, is there anybody in doubt about what the Bible says? It's, it's clear. In this country, we all know that, in the Western world. Although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. I've just read that all to you, haven't I? They not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. That's the issue, folks. Why, why am I doing this now? Because an entire party in the United States has given hearty approval. Soon eudakeo. Eudakeo means to agree with, to consent to, to be well pleased, to think it is good. Soon means together with others. Collectively, this group has decided that this is good. And they give hearty approval. No wonder they didn't want God in their original platform. We have to speak the truth to rescue the perishing. You're going to have the opportunity to vote this week, and many people are saying this could be the most important election in decades in our nation. How do you as a Christian approach that? Well, let me make it very simple for you. The Bible says that the role of government is to punish evildoers and to reward the righteous. So you need to vote in such a way as to uphold justice and honesty and morality. You, you need to vote for those people who would be most representative of a biblical morality and understanding the role of government as punishing evildoers and rewarding the righteous. Vote in a way that reflects what you know the Word of God teaches as much as you possibly can. God will honor that. Go out and vote.